Shabbat Shalom. You're welcome to get lost in your prayer books, but I'm going to talk for just a couple minutes. And if you'd like, you can put those books away and we can learn some Torah together. See, I've been wrestling with a particular verse from this week's Torah portion. You're familiar with it. Something puzzling that Pharaoh says to Moses and Aaron before urging the Israelites to flee Egypt. It's in this week's Torah portion that we read Pharaoh's reaction to the final plague, providing much more detail than the Passover Haggadah. After awakening to loud cries coming from every household around his kingdom, the angel of death smote every firstborn Egyptian son. Pharaoh summons Moses and Aaron in the middle of the night and begs them to leave. All of the Israelites were to depart at once, taking their possessions, even their herds and their flocks. And just before Moses and Aaron depart Pharaoh's chamber, we read that verse that's been giving me trouble this week. Pharaoh asks, and may you bring a blessing upon me also. Strikingly. Before banishing the Israelites from Egypt, Pharaoh asks Moses and Aaron to pray for him. But why? According to the medieval commentator Rashi, the answer is simple. Pharaoh is the firstborn son, and he, fe he feared that he would be killed too. Other commentators suggest that Pharaoh asks Moses and Aaron to pray for his well-being because Pharaoh is concerned about potential future punishment. This part of the Torah is always left out of the Hollywood portrayals. It wasn't included in the Ten Commandments or the Prince of Egypt's rendition of the Passover narrative. I share this relatively unknown yet significant exchange between Pharaoh and Moses because it speaks to one of Judaism's most fundamental yet difficult teachings about humanity, which is teshuva, the ever-present opportunity for repentance and repair. It's a reminder that as Jews, we must never harden our hearts so as to shut ourselves off from hearing others' remorse or apology. It urges us to cultivate mercy to be sure, there are some acts so heinous that they are not open to full teshuva, murder being one of them. But assuming that most of us are not dealing in that realm, tonight I want to discuss teshuva, one of our most foundational Jewish values, as a gift for us, and something we can model for the rest of the world serving as we are called by the prophet Isaiah to be a light unto the nations. To believe in teshuva, we first must be able to see the godliness in the other. What I mean is to know that all humans are made but selim Elohim, in the image of God. Let's talk in a way that's a bit more down to earth and relevant to our everyday lives that same striving to see others as simply another human being worthy of God's blessing and our kindness is important to remember when we argue. Disagreement and differences of opinion are healthy, and they happen all the time. In fact, Jewish tradition encourages dialogue and debate. The rabbis of antiquity engaged daily in what they called machloket, or disputes between two different schools of thought. The oral arguments that took place in the major academies of Babylonia and Jerusalem were later written down in the Talmud, often preserving both the majority and the minority opinion on the very same page. In doing so, the rabbis modeled for us what it means to see godliness in others. 
even those with whom we disagree, even those who hurt our feelings. When we tear down the artificial walls separating us for the sake of learning and growing, the Talmud teaches that's when we invite God into our midst. I've told the following story a few times, but it so beautifully captures this message, and so I'm going to share it again. A rabbi once asked his students, how do we know when the night has ended and the day has begun? The first student answered, when I can look out into the fields and I can distinguish between my field and the field of my neighbor. That's when I know the night has ended and the day has begun. Another responded, when I see a house and I can tell that it's my house and not the house of my neighbor, that's when I know the night has ended and the day has begun. Third student says, when I see a flower, and I can make out the colors of that flower, whether they're red or yellow or blue, that's when the night has ended and the day has begun. Each answer brought a sadder frown to the rabbi's face. None of you understand. You only divide. You divide your house from the house of your neighbor, your field from the field of your neighbor. You separate one color from all of the others. It's not all we can do. Divide, separate, splitting our world into pieces. Isn't it broken enough? The students then ask, so Rabbi, how do we know that the night has ended and the day has begun? The rabbi stared back into the faces of his students, and with a voice suddenly gentle and imploring, he said, when you look into the face of the person who is beside you, and you can see that person is your brother and your sister, then finally the night has ended and the day has begun. There are all kinds of looming existential problems with real enemies. But looking at the relationships in our lives amongst our people, what point can we bridge the divides that threaten to break us apart? There should be justice for the wrongs done against us, but too often we apply that framework to our interpersonal relationships as well where we can prioritize mercy instead. We do this in part because it allows us to release ourselves from the pain of interpersonal conflict, which at the end of the day only strengthens us against the truly existential threats that loom. Like holding a smoldering coal in our clenched fist, the pain we feel when we are personally wrong only burns us. Reconciliation is releasing that hot coal. Treating others with mercy requires us first to see the humanity in the other, understanding that like ourselves, they are but human, capable of making mistakes. In time, with work, making it better. One of the reasons I'm struggling with this portion is because its message comes from an unexpected teacher. This is the most important Jewish lesson that Pharaoh teaches us. Important nonetheless. There has to be a reason that Torah includes Pharaoh's request to Moses and Aaron for them to pray for him. Tonight I read it as an invitation to us and a reminder in our relationships with family and with friends and others, as long as we are alive, there is always the possibility that someone's heart might be softened. We have to ask then, what would we do? As one modern teacher writes, perhaps that is the ultimate vision of our hope for those with whom we struggle, that they transform. And so can we. This portion reminds us that in time and with much soul work, that shared transformation can be possible 
and we lead with mercy. Shabbat shalom.